Welcome to Hope City Church. This is a place where you don't have to have it all together. Where it's okay to not be okay. We're all in the same boat. That's why we gather every Sunday, because we believe Jesus gives us a better way to do life. This is a place where we can connect and grow in our faith, where we are challenged to not settle for complacency. Where we pursue grace and truth with a desire to become more like Jesus. Our ultimate hope is to be a place where we bump into Jesus and experience His life-changing hope. This hope changes our families. This hope changes our workplaces and cities. This hope changes you, and this hope changes me. This hope is for everyone. Right now, after seeing that, I feel like we should be running out on the field to play a game or something. But man, that might be one of my favorite series intro videos we've ever done. Uh, shout out to, to Oliver, who was on drums today. Andrew, our worship leader for the music part of that. Jason Miller, Jared Taylor did all the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, man, it's just awesome. We've got an incredible team around here. Uh, hey, we're kicking off this brand new series called Join the Rhythm. Uh, and here's what's true, and that's why we chose that song, Seven Nation Army. There's nothing quite like a good rhythm, is there? Uh, By definition, a rhythm is a repeated pattern or habit. It's one small thing that over time leads to something greater than itself. I mean, if you think about a song, like one beat isn't much, but when you put multiple beats and rhythms together, it forms a song. Or maybe you think about rhythms in athletics. Um, Maybe it's running, right? Like one step isn't much. But when you get in rhythm with your breathing and multiple strides, like you could run a marathon. I, I can't, but you can if you want to. Go for it. Okay, we'll pray for you, all right? Um, or if you think about spiritually, one small step could actually create spiritual rhythms in your life that, that could not just change your life, but could actually bring hope to the world around you. Um, earlier this year, Ash and I started a rhythm of like going to the gym regularly. And man, it's been hard work getting there. There's days where we can't wait to be there, but I'll I'll be honest with you. Most days we're like, I I can't think of anything else to do. So we have to go to the gym and we'd rather do anything else. Uh, But the rhythm of fitness has made us healthier, like mentally, physically, and I would even argue spiritually. And over time, the rhythm of fitness has created some patterns and habits in our lives that are changing us. Uh, We've got a community at the gym now. We've got friends we didn't have before, and and we're not who we used to be. Literally, we've collectively lost over 50 pounds together, and and like we got rid of that. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be a fun morning, isn't it? So in this series, what we're looking at are the rhythms of life that Jesus really cared about. And we're going to look at these questions. What does it mean to be part of Hope City? If you call this your church, what does that mean? And how can we be the kinds of people who develop rhythms in our lives that give hope away to everyone around us? And each week and at the end of the series, we're going to ask that if Hope City is your church, like if somebody stopped you on the street and they're like, hey, where do you go to church? You're like, this, this church called Hope City. We're going to ask that you would join the rhythm and be part of giving hope to Northwest Arkansas and beyond. In this series, we're going to take a look at these three rhythms or areas of life that Jesus talked about a lot. And the goal of this series is that if we take Jesus at his word, like we just sang about a few minutes ago, and we take these areas of life seriously, that that we might experience the hope that we're looking for in our own lives, and and we might be the people, the community that gives hope away to everyone around us. So we're going to take a look at at, at generosity. Did did you know that one out of every six times Jesus opened his mouth, he actually talked about money? And, And my guess is that the biggest indicator of our trust in him, like Jesus says, is what we do with our money. Like, if you look at your life, if you look at your indicator for success, security, or stress, it it probably revolves around money. And and then we're going to talk about serving. How can we be a community that loves and serves people in a way that they get to experience Jesus? And and then we're going to talk about community and what it looks like to walk through this life together. We were intended to be in life together. So think about this for you personally. 
What if taking a small step in these three rhythms over the next four months of 2023, just for the rest of the year, what, what if it could lead you to a place where these rhythms, they don't feel so hard? They, they start to feel more normal. They become part of the ongoing muscle memory rhythms of your life. You think that could lead to a better life and maybe a better relationship with Jesus? And then out of the overflow of that, do you think that would change your interactions with the people that are closest to you? And then think about us as a community that call Hope City our church. Can you imagine the impact that hundreds of us that call Hope City our home, like our church, if we all joined the rhythm together? Man, what, what would that look like? What can we do together? Coming together to worship on Sunday mornings and, and serving and loving each other and learning together in here, but then taking what we learn and going out there and actually putting it into practice, talking about it in groups, and then starting to prioritize like financially the things that Jesus really cares about. And here's what happens. If we do that, then Hope City gets better. And if Hope City gets better, then we're set up to give hope to our world, our cities, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and everywhere that we show up. And here's the reality. Those places that we go, there's people represented there. And Jesus loves all those people. And guess who he's chosen to show them his love? You and me. It's us, right? That's what we're signing up for when we, when we follow him. And so he wants to use us to show every person where we live, work, and go that he's real and he's true and he cares about them. Does that make sense? All right, so let's dive into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let's talk about generosity. And some of you are like, yay, I was hoping they would talk about money when I came to church this morning. <laughs> well, let's be honest. Some of you just cringed because you hate it when the church talks about money. Oh, or you invited a friend here today and you're already leaning over and apologizing to them. Or you're, you're thinking, man, I'm going to fake going to the bathroom and then I can just slip out the door and they won't even notice that I was here today. So, so let's just rip the band-aid right off, okay? Uh, this is awkward for all of us. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, feel like that there are more things in your life that need to get done than you have time to do? Anyone? Yeah, that's okay. Raise your hand. Yeah, me too. Uh, how many of you feel like there are more things in your life that you want or need to spend money on than you have the money to spend? Anybody? Uh, yeah, that should probably be every hand in the room, right? Uh, how many of you feel like your life is already too busy? Anybody? Yeah, that's all of us. Okay, so if that is true, if we can collectively agree on those things, then this is also true. Every single day of our lives, we are choosing to make a sacrifice, meaning that we are choosing to say no to one thing so that we can say yes to something else. The question we want to look at today is, are we sacrificing the right things? See, rhythm, it requires sacrifice. It requires you putting in the time at the gym, putting in the time as a musician, uh, putting in the time to get better at your job, putting in the time to raise your kids uh, to become who they were created to be. And, and generosity is also a rhythm. So generosity requires sacrifice. And, and let's be honest, sacrifice is hard, right? Like, like let's just get that out there. It, it would be so much more fun if we had unlimited time, unlimited, um, unlimited energy, unlimited money, right? But we don't. And, and so if you're like me, you're already thinking like, I don't think this is going to be much fun today. Why did I come to church? I could have just slept in. But if you're willing to work through a little bit of not fun, then maybe the rhythm of generosity could actually lead you to something really good on the other side. Maybe, maybe this rhythm could actually lead you into freedom. So, so let's dive into this. Uh, why did Jesus talk about money one out of every six times he opened his mouth? Well, why is this such a big deal? Well, in his most famous sermon titled The Sermon on the Mount Jesus broke down what it looks like to live a life that's in rhythm with his kingdom and his priorities and his purposes, and one that has the best shot at leading us to the hope that we want to experience in our lives. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus takes on money head on in this sermon. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Meaning this, that the thing that you love the most, the thing that you prioritize the most, will get most of your money. Right? Like, like, it's just true. If you follow me around for like a month or a day, uh, you'll see how I spend my money. And who I spend my money on is who I love. I, I love my wife and I love my kids. Therefore, they get a lot of my money. All right? Just being honest. Um, I love mountain biking. I love hockey. I love like a good bourbon or a good coffee. I love camping. So those things get my money, right? It's just true. But then Jesus continues on. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. The reality is we're all serving something or someone other than ourselves. The question is who? He goes, either you'll, you'll love the one and you'll hate the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. And then he cuts to the heart of it where we're like, it's really hard. He goes, you can't serve both God and money. Meaning this, we're all enslaved to something. Whatever has your heart has you. So what has your heart? 
Whatever you sacrifice for is the thing that you love the most. And the thing that you love the most will control you. I mean, just look at your life. It's, it's what happens, right? So here's a question. Are, are you sacrificing the right things in the right way? Because one master, in this example, Jesus points to money. That master will always leave you wanting more. But, but the other master, God, he's the only one who can truly fulfill you and lead you into a life of freedom. That's what Jesus wants for you around this. See, generosity requires sacrifice. So are we sacrificing in a way that will enslave us to something that's never enough? Or are we sacrificing in a way that will lead you into the life and freedom that you want? Like, like you can't have both. You have to choose. And and just being honest, like, when it comes to choices, I don't know about you, I don't like that. Like, Like, I don't like that. See, we live in a world where the number one advice we get, the number one worldview that we're told is, hey, follow your heart. Pursue your dreams. Be true to yourself. Live your truth. And and the message behind that is this. To be fulfilled in life is to pursue whatever makes me happy. Like run after whatever fulfills me. But but what if, what if, what fulfills me actually comes in conflict with something else I desire? Like like what if my desires don't align with each other? For for example, what if you want to be like the wealthiest, most successful person in your company, but you also want plenty of time to enjoy what you love doing, and you want plenty of time for your family. Like those two things come in conflict, right? Uh, what if you want to be able to eat and drink whatever you want, whenever you want, but, but you also want to live a long, good life, and you want, to, you want to be in good shape? Like those two things come in conflict. Uh, what if you want to find the freedom that comes with money and, and wealth and being single, but you also desire the closeness and love of a family right? and the joy of raising kids? Those two things come in conflict. And so that leads to the second thing, that our world tells us, hey, pursue whatever you desire the most because you can have it all. You can do it all, right? But, but we know this, we can't. It just doesn't work that way. We, we are finite creatures. We have limits and capacity and only so much time and energy and ability and money. Hey, if you were infinite, then here's the reality. You'd already have that new toy or whatever it is that you've been wanting. You'd already have that new job. You'd already have that raise at work. But you don't yet. You can't do everything. You can't be everything that you want to be. And so we have to choose. And choosing one path always necessarily means saying no to another. But man, if you're like me, like, I don't like that. See, see if this connects at all. The tape that plays through my head goes like this. It goes, I can do it all. I can actually keep all the plates spinning and be everything to everyone. And then it leads to a place where it moves beyond I can do it all to I have to do it all. You ever felt that? And... um over time, like that just paints us into a corner. I, I felt this when, when I came to Plant Hope City. If you've ever started anything from the ground up, like a business or a program or anything like that, then you know that like a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and like sleepless nights and hard work goes into it. And I thought I could take it all on. I was so convinced that God had called our family to this, and he had. And I was convinced that, that, that I was the one that he called, and he did, that, that I thought it was my responsibility to come up with all the people, all the resources, and all the money it takes to, to, to make a church exist. Guess what? That wasn't my responsibility. I, I've shared this before, but it all came to a breaking point for me when I was struggling with hardcore anxiety and like trying to do it all, feeling like I was failing in every area of life. I was ready to quit. But then Jesus reminded me, like, Hey, Adam, I'm the one that builds the church, not you, okay? So are you willing to get out of the way and just trust me that I'm going to be faithful to what I said I was going to do? And will you just be faithful to me in the work that I've called you to? And would you let go of the pride and the control that are behind the scenes making you think you can do it all? And then he asked me this question. What story do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell the story of a man who tried to take it all on? and burned out in anxiety, and lost his family along the way? Or do you want to tell the story of a man who, like, trusted Jesus to build his church and gave all credit and honor and glory to who it was due anyway? I I had to choose. See, we love to think that we have limitless choices before us, but eventually the normal limits of our life press in, don't they? And our choices become constrained, and we're forced to make decisions. Our our past choices lead to an ultimatum, like your health shuts down, or or the bank calls on your loan, or your spouse files papers, or or your kids shut you out and leave, or or worse, right? And so here's one more thing. Doing nothing is a choice in itself. Pursuing one desire means saying no to another, and if you wait until it's too late, then the choice may be made for you. 
A New York Times columnist, David Brooks, he writes this. He says, if you aren't saying a permanent no to anything, if you aren't giving anything up, then you're probably, you probably aren't diving into anything fully. A life of contentment means saying a thousand no's for the sake of a few precious yeses. And so that leads us to the next question. What, what, what are we going to sacrifice or say no to in our lives so that we can say yes to something better? Is what I'm filling my life up with coming at the expense of something more important? And, and you may be going, hey, Adam, I thought we were talking about money today. What does this have to do with money? Well, everything, because generosity requires sacrifice. So why is generosity so important and why is it worth sacrificing for? So, so let me tell us a quick story from the life of Jesus, okay? Let, let me set this up. Jesus is teaching. I would assume that it's probably out in the field because it says that there were thousands of people pressing around and Jesus is just like preaching and throwing down. And then like awkwardly in the back of, of the church, these two brothers jump into a family argument over their father's inheritance. So uh, let's take a look at this in Luke chapter 12, verse 13. One of these brothers stands up and he goes, hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, could you imagine that in here right now? Like, that, that had to be awkward. Like, bringing a family disagreement into, into church, like, that never happens, right? But anyway, um, I'm kidding there. It does happen all the time. But um, th- this brother's going, our dad died. My brother won't split the inheritance with me fairly. So, Jesus, you have to fix this. And so Jesus replied, hey, man, who appointed me to be a judge or arbiter between the two of you? Then he said to them, be, or watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So, so first, apparently what Jesus is telling us is that there's several kinds of greed that we have to watch out for. And, and second, life does not consist in an abundance or the quantity of possessions, which brings up a question. What, what does life consist of? And so Jesus is going to tell a story. It's known as a parable, but it's just a story to help explain what life consists of. He says that the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So quiz time here, okay? You guys ready? What, what yielded the harvest? What's it say? The ground yielded the harvest, right? So who makes crops grow out of the ground? God does, right? And in your head, you might be going, yeah, well, the, the rich man planted the seeds. Right, okay? But if the ground didn't cooperate, then all he did was just stick a bunch of seeds in the ground, right? And so he's feeling pretty cocky. He's feeling pretty sure of himself. He's like, man, I've done all this hard work. Look at all this stuff that I've got, this abundant harvest. And so he he tells this little speech, like says this little speech to himself in his head. And, And check this out. I want you to pay attention to the pronouns he uses in this conversation going on inside his head. The rich man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store whose crops? My crops. Who who made the crops grow? God, right? Uh, Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. You've done all this hard work. You deserve this. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, here's the scary thing you got to remember, okay? And, And you may want to write this down. God hears all those conversations going on inside our heads. <laughs> like, I wish, I, I wish it wasn't true, but it just is. And so God said to him in this next moment, he goes, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. You're going to die. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? And then Jesus makes this cutting statement. He says, this is how it will be. This is how life works with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. This guy's living the American dream, isn't he? If you take farming out and you put in any other career or pursuit, the, the idea is that his hard work resulted in more stuff and money than he even had the capacity to hold. Hey, we'd look at that and we would call it a success story, right? So why does God look at this man and his success story and call it foolish? Well, well the answer is not because he's rich. Because there's nothing wrong or sinful with being rich or having big barns. So so what's really going on here? Well, well, remember why Jesus told this story to begin with, right? He's warning against all kinds of greed. And he's talking about what life does and does not consist of. And, And so Jesus is pointing out that this man is a fool because he lived under the illusion that his success was primarily due to his own hard work. Remember, who made the seeds grow? 
God did, right? His success was primarily due to his own hard work. Therefore, the, re- the rewards from that, the results of that, were my stuff, my time, my money is for me. That's greed. That is a sin. And, and then he stored up things for himself. It's not a sin, right? It's not a sin to, to have things for ourselves. That, that's not a sin. But he did it to the neglect and exclusion of God. That, that is a sin. This man failed to ask, what does God want done? And instead, he chose to prioritize what he wanted done at the neglect and exclusion of God. See, one of the most convicting lines in this story that's tucked in there, and I've missed it so many times that I've read through this, is that last phrase that's highlighted in red. This is how it will be. This is how it will be. See, this guy, is, he, he spent his whole life preparing for a future that he has no control over. And something happens that's totally out of his control. He, he dies. And then Jesus asks the question, who gets what you spent your life on? And the convicting answer for all of us is, like, this is just true. Not you. Not you, right? And, and the key word in this, in this story is, is this. What is this? Well, Jesus says it's, it's total loss. It's wasted life, wasted time, wasted opportunity. This man missed out on the purpose of his life, the reason that God had made the crops grow out of the ground to begin with. He missed out because he was hanging on to my stuff for me, and he had the opportunity to say, God, what do you want to do with this in a way that would make an impact that outlived him? But in the, in the end, he lost everything. Jesus said it this way in another part of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple or my follower, like if you claim to follow Jesus, Jesus is writing this to you. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Say no to something less important. And take up their cross and follow me. Say yes to something far more important. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, will find it. What, what good will it be if someone gains the whole world, yet in the process loses their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I mean, that last question is the hardest one, isn't it? Our version might look something like this. What can I do to get back someone or something I lost that was really important? Because I was paying attention to the wrong thing. Something less important. And here's the answer. Nothing. Nothing. So what if Hope City? What if Jesus is actually, when he's talking about money, trying to get us to think about our priorities in a way that's actually going to lead to a better life? What, what if making a sacrifice through the rhythm of generosity was actually a way to pay attention and keep our heart in tune with the most important things in our lives? What if it actually leads you to something you want more? Remember, Jesus said the number one revealer of what is most important to your heart is, is how and where you point your money. So what if the rhythm of generosity could actually lead your heart toward the thing that you want more? What, what if it could actually lead you to a life with fewer regrets and a life of freedom? So here's the ask for us this morning, okay? Y'all knew it was coming. So, but it, what if we all took a big step towards the biblical teaching of giving 10% of our income to God's work being done in the local church? The church that's your place of community and worship and growth. What if that actually has the the possibility of of leading you into a rhythm of a better life that's actually the life that you want? A life with fewer regrets and more freedom. Remember, Jesus promised that one master, money, will enslave you and leave you wanting more. It's never enough. But God said another another master himself has the ability to fulfill you and do more with just 10% of your income than you're capable of doing with 100% on your own. So, So what's going through your head right now? All right, what, what conversations are you having with me right now? Some of you are like, man, this is why I don't go to church, or this is why I left the church, or this is why I don't trust organized religion. At churches, they just always want our money. Or, man, if we give, Adam probably gives, gets a raise. Not true, okay? I, I, I don't claim to know what goes through your head, but here's what goes on in my head. I'm just going to be brutally honest and transparent with you. If I were to give more money, an increasing percentage of the money that I make to the work that God's doing through Hope City, that would mean that I have less money to spend on the things that I want that feel really important to me. And I just don't know if I want to do that. But, like, that's the brutally honest truth. Generosity requires sacrifice. Hope City, did you know that the generosity of others literally allows this church to exist? 
Churches and people across the country believe that you mattered more than whatever else they could have done with their money. We're, we're a brand new church, and if it wasn't for the generosity of others, we wouldn't be here. You, you know, people wanted to give you hope through their finances, and they may never meet you. But literally, because of other people's generosity, I mean, think about this. You've got a chair to sit in right now. I, I've got a microphone to teach through every week. We've got staff and volunteers downstairs with kids helping the next generation get to know and love Jesus because of other people's generosity. We've got a worship leader and a band and visuals and and great teams behind the scenes every single week that help remind us of who God is and what he's like through worship because of other people's generosity. And Hope City, man, God is doing incredible work through this church. I just want to celebrate with you all. I mean, this year alone, we've had over 200 people walk through these doors for the first time. Over 100 of those people were just in the summer months alone. We grew faster this summer than any other point as a church. And I hope you know this. Churches don't grow in the summer. Like, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't happen. Like, God is doing something here. We've had 14 baptisms as a church since we launched. launched, And 10 of those have been this year. We've literally been a witness to miracles of life change happening spiritually in people. We've had over 50 of you jump into a group and get together in a circle around like a living room or a coffee shop or at a bar or whatever, and you've talked life and faith in Jesus, and you've given a way to other people to serve and love them. Now, over 75 of you volunteer here on the weekends to help create a community where people know, like, this is how Jesus served and this is how Jesus loved. You're taking care of those people that are walking through the doors the first time. I mean, so many of you, you, you thought you were done with church. There was, there was never going to be a church that you would walk into. But you got invited to Hope City. Maybe, maybe you've never been to church or you gave up on church. And I hear from you almost every single week that you're like, man, this community is changing my life. Man, and Hope City, you're an incredibly generous church. You, you give away thousands of dollars every single month to throw parties in our community through Johnson Square. Now, you send kids at Tyson Elementary School on field trips to, 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 to let them know that we're with them. And you let teachers know that they're not alone through food and other resources. They let them know that we're behind them. And then we have this partner called Shared Beginnings. Hope City, you gave away hundreds of car seats and hundreds of backpacks going, uh, for kids going back to school this year. I mean, literally, kids walked into school with hope strapped on their back because of your generosity. You threw a party in this room right here where, where, where adoptee, adoptees and, and kids in foster care and adoptive families and, and foster families and birth families got to be reunited, some for the first time. Just to experience hope. Hope City, you're making an incredible impact on this community. And I think we're just getting started. And so what I want to do here as we get ready to close out is I want to nerd out with you for just a minute, okay? Is that all right? I, I want to be transparent about the financial position of our church. And so I want you to take a look at this next graph, all right? Everything that I just talked about, everything that we celebrate, everything that we clap about, all that God is doing here, it, it doesn't run on Magic Jesus fairy dust. It actually takes money, okay? Um, I wish it did run on Magic Jesus fairy dust. That'd be great, but it takes money to do it. And so we run on a budget of about $25,000 a month, all right? That's that top right. And then your generosity covers about ten dollars to $12,000 of that every month, about, about half of what it takes to do what we do, everything that we just celebrated. And then you may be wondering, like, so how do we make up the rest? Well, because of generosity of other churches and, and, and other individuals across the country, um, we were able, before we launched, to get, a, to get a really good balance in our bank account. So as of today, we have about $125,000 as a church in our bank account, which allows us to run a monthly deficit of four to $6,000. And, and you may be thinking, oh, crap, the church runs a deficit. Like, every new church runs a deficit, okay? We expected that. We planned for that. That's why we worked on that bank account. And then the, the, the next section that makes up for that is our partner church in Louisville, Kentucky, Southeast Christian Church, they give just over $3,000 monthly to the work being done here because they believe in you. They, they, they want to be generous with us so you get to experience hope. And then uh, you may not know this, but we are part of a network of churches that are planting churches. Uh, it's called the Hope City Network. And so Hope City in Joplin, Missouri gives us $4,500 a month to make up the rest, of, the rest of that gap or the rest of that deficit. And so here's our goal, Hope City. Here's what we want to run after. From now to the end of the year, we, we really need to move out of the red and into the black, all right? We, we want to make up that four to $6,000 deficit by the end of the year, we, which means that we need to see giving increase by four to $6,000 each month. And, and then we want to look at Southeast Christian Church by the end of 2024, and we want to say, hey, thanks for your generosity. We're off and going. We've got it from here. 
And then we want to look at Hope City Joplin by early 2025, and we want to go, man, thanks for believing and investing in us and planting a new church. Where's the next church going to go? We, we want to help start that one. But, man, that's just the tip of the iceberg because that just funds what we're doing currently. I, I mean, Hope City, we, we, we are a church that's been given a vision that, that we want to invest in future church plants. We, we want to be able to give generously to other organizations in our community and globally that are making a difference. I mean, think about it. Shared Beginnings, the work that they are doing is to make it so that kids aren't growing up like where adoption is part of their story or they're not growing up in foster care. What if we could be more generous in that kind of work? What if we had our own building one day? You talk to our loading crew or any of our staff and they're like, yes, please. We get up at 6 a.m. and roll in cases every single Sunday. But what if there was a physical space in our community that every time people looked at it, they're like, I don't get that whole Jesus thing that they do. But every time I see Hope City, that represents hope. Like those people, if they, ever, if they went away, like our community, community would be worse off for it. Man, if we're going to do that, that's going to take more staff and it's going to take upgrades eventually we want to be able to stream everything that we do in here on the weekend online so that before people ever walk through these doors, they get to experience what they're walking into. They get to experience Jesus and his hope. I mean, ultimately the vision, Hope City, of why we exist is because we want everyone everywhere to experience the hope and the good news of Jesus. He doesn't hate them, that he loves them, and he wants good for them. That's what we're running after. And that type of vision requires generosity. Here's the bottom line takeaway from today. If you, if you don't take anything else away, vision requires generosity. Generosity is going to require sacrifice. It requires all of us stacking hands and saying, God, we want to run after what you want for us in this church in a way that like, maybe we never have before. And that vision, it moves at the speed of generosity. The faster that we say, let's be generous, the faster we get after that vision. It goes as fast or as slow as we want it to, all right? Now, what I'm not talking about here is one-off generosity. Like, man, I dropped a 20 in the back on my way out. What Jesus is getting at is like a lifestyle of generosity, of making sacrifice and generosity a rhythm of everyday life. Not, not so that the church can get your money, okay? But Jesus actually wants something for you around this. He wants to ensure that you live a life of freedom in this area of life and so that you don't look back over your life and have this terrible aha moment, just like the rich man in the story that we looked at, and you realize that you lived your life for you and you missed out on the bigger things that God wanted to do in you and through you. Let's check out this video. Kevin, Richmond. Yeah. And Peggy. I yeah. hey, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about our journey in faith. And to me, it's been like a large puzzle. Uh, and a large piece of that f puzzle is is your giving, your generosity, and that was probably the one piece that I had the most trouble trying to fit in. It was just really hard for me. Uh, it wasn't hard for Peggy. It's hard mm -hmm. for me uh, to bring myself to give the amount of money that I thought I needed to be giving to the church, and. It took years and the journey was long, but until you finally get that one puzzle piece in, the rest of the pieces don't fit together. And uh, I can remember the first time that uh, I heard the, the saying that look to where your money is pointed, therein lies your heart. And that really got to me and I thought I got to change, I got to do something. So we decided to step up years ago and try to get more gracious in our giving. And I'll never forget that first time that I wrote a check out for the amount that I thought was appropriate. And it was hard and I didn't want to send it. And, uh, but I just finally sent it. And, uh, and from that moment, things began to change for us. I mean, it was like overnight yeah. Once we became generous in our giving to the church and to Christ, it seemed like that puzzle piece fell into place and everything else began to fall into place. I saw things happen in our lives that never happened before. And I, I can't overestimate the, the importance of that. But yet it was the hardest one for us to overcome. And I think one of the, the early on in our journey primarily me, I'll take the blame for all this. You know, I wanted to uh, cop out in my giving. I thought that I could just give my time and effort 
to the church and that would suffice instead of actually giving money. And that was wrong. And I played that game for years and years and years. And I can just tell you right now, if you don't trust uh, uh, the church that you want to give the money to, if you don't trust who you're giving your money to, then you probably need to go find another church. Um, so whenever that piece fell into place and we started giving, and it, it, a funny thing started happening. I found my good things started happening. Our faith started to grow in just numerous ways. And even our marriage, our marriage, yeah, it grew. Yeah, it, yeah. well, yeah. you make me feel kind of stupid now for not putting that out front, but. Uh, uh, I but, had to say that. Yeah, yeah, it did, so. The one thing I have noticed in him is I'm seeing things just shed and his heart growing and caring for people and and sharing the gospel. I'm seeing that a lot. Um, we came up with the idea that we would not only give 10% from you know our personal finances, but we would give 10% off the top of what our businesses made. But our business grew fivefold within the first year. Mm -hmm. I, I never dreamed that we would see those kind of results just because of our faithfulness and our generosity. God has blessed me, so I view this as my opportunity to bless others. Mm -hmm. And I find that opportunity in every aspect of life. If I have that opportunity to turn around and use what God has blessed me with, I want to bless others with the same exact thing. And, uh, and I feel like that's the reason that He has blessed us with this, was because uh, it has given me an opportunity to reach other people and to bless other people with what He has given me. Hey, we guys give it up for Kevin and Peggy real quick. Man, they, they do an incredible job kind of sharing their story, but um, what you don't know is it's more awkward talking to a camera than it is a room full of people, and they just did a killer job with that. So we're really grateful for you guys sharing that, Peggy. Uh, Kevin probably left the room because he was like, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> so, so Hope City, um, let's close here. Um, would you join the rhythm of, giving, of generosity with us? By, by investing in this church so you can make available to others what you're getting to experience here. And, and there is a need, right? Like, it, we need to make up a deficit of four to $6,000 a month by the end of the year. And, and then we need to look at our partner churches and just say, hey, thank you, we have it from here. We don't want to become the 35-year-old kid living in our parents' basement, like living off their money forever. No, we want to take responsibility financially and in every way for this church. And then we want to invest in a way that allows us to plant future churches. We want to invest in a way that Hope City is something that we get to hand off to the next generation. And we look at our kids and we go, hey, you've got it from here. And so from now till the end of the year, here's what we're asking. If you're already giving, would you consider giving at least 1% more of your income to the work that God is doing through Hope City? And if you're not getting, giving yet, would you consider taking just a small step to join the rhythm and give at least 1% of your income to the work that God is doing here through this church? I, I did the math this week, and the average income in Northwest, Ar or, yeah, average yearly income in Northwest Arkansas is sixty-five thousand dollars. That breaks down to about fifty-four hundred dollars a month. Okay, uh, that's fifty-four dollars per person per month. Times about a hundred adults who would call Hope City their church. You can't make this crap up, all right? Um, that's five thousand four hundred sixteen dollars is what it came out to. Fifty-four dollars per month per person would make up our deficit. I, I mean, think about what $54 per month represents for you. It's a drive through meal, right? It's a few cups of coffee. It's what you're saving up for that other bike. I, I mean, think about it. Do you, want, do you want to make an impact that's going to outlive you? Or are you going to look back at the end of your life and be like, man, I'm missing out on one more, on one more Big Mac. I wish I would have had that. I, I wish I would have had one more cup of coffee. I wish I would have had another bike. You can't even ride it anymore anyway, all right? Man, invest in something that's going to outlive you. There, there are three ways that you can give uh, to Hope City. Um, in the back, it says black buckets. It's actually a black box now. Uh, you can drop cash or checks in there when you're here. You can go online, hope for nwa.city, or you can actually text Hope City NWA to 77977, and it'll send you a link, and, and you can do it right from your phone. Um, and, and this is an opportunity for you to join the rhythm of generosity. In fact, online is one of the ways that most people do it. 
because you can actually get in a rhythm of giving that makes sense where it, where it happens automatically every single month. Um, here's, what I, here's what I want to promise you around this, okay? Uh, you're not going to hear this in any other church. Um, we smoke what we sell, okay? <laughs> Think about it for a minute. <laughs> We, we smoke what we sell. What, what I mean by that is that my family is in this too. We, we had to collectively make the decision to make a sacrifice this week. That we were going to step up our giving because we need to. We're, we're going to do what we ask everybody else to do. And if this is your church, if you call Hope City your church, if you're here for the first time, I promise we don't talk about money every week, okay? This is the first time in months that we've talked about it. Um, but if this is your church, we're asking you to partner with us and do the same. Second thing we'll say is that this is between you and God, all right? But our goal is to help build a healthy, sustainable rhythm of a generous community that gives hope away to the people around us. Our goal for you is to grow to look more and more like Jesus. And Jesus said that the way that he gets to mold you, the way that he gets to shape you is when he has your heart. What's the number one indicator of your heart? It's where you point your money. And so for us not to point to this, not to talk about it, would not be giving you the best shot you have to grow in your faith. Here's the other promise. I I can tell you 100% that this might be the one thing that Jesus wants to use to grow your faith more than anything else. That's what Kevin and Peggy just talked about. I can tell you it's true in my life. I don't have time to get into the story today. I've already talked long enough, all right? But, man, here's here's what I can promise you is that this is the area of life where God said, test me. You want to see if I'm faithful? Put me to the test and see if I don't take care of you in ways that that don't make sense. For me, money represents security. So if I have a lot of money, guess what? I get to keep myself secure. If I point my money towards Jesus, though, and he has my heart, guess who's keeping me secure in that moment? It's him, right? So here's what we want to say. If by the end of the year you haven't experienced growth in your faith or in your relationship with Jesus through generosity, please don't give another penny to Hope City. In fact, go find another church because we are clearly doing something wrong if Jesus can't be taken at his word. Go go somewhere else that you believe in and go invest there. Here's the reality. There's nothing to lose around this and everything to gain if you learn to trust Jesus with this part of your life. One last thing. Um, We're going to set up every week of the Join the Rhythm series uh, Zoom calls at 8.30 p.m. on Sunday nights. And so uh, once you get your kids in bed, we would love for you to join us for 30, 45 minutes online where we're going to give kind of a behind the scenes look of each topic we talk about each week because we believe that this is so important for us to join the rhythm together in these areas of life. All right. Um, So you can scan that QR code. You can sign up. We'll email a a link out later today uh, and then you can hop on that tonight and we'll do a behind the scenes call around our, our generosity. All right. Let's close here. Hope City, vision requires our generosity collectively. Individually, it's going to take sacrifice. And the vision that God has given this church moves at the speed of our generosity. So let's join the rhythm. But let's give hope through generosity. We're going to move into our time of prayer that we do every week to remember that that's true. That, That Jesus, he modeled sacrifice for us first. And then he invited us, follow me. Do what I do. He gave up the perfection of heaven to come down in our direction to show us who God is and what he's like and to show us how to be human. And then ultimately, he laid down his life for us through the cross so that we could experience hope and good news and life that doesn't just end when this life is over, but life that goes on for eternity. And so we're going to pass communion here in these next few minutes. It's going to be a reminder of bread and juice that reminds us that that's true. And then we're going to have a time of prayer where you can just connect with God individually or we'll have some people right down front here that would love to pray with you if you need prayer for anything. And I'd just love to invite you. Ask God what he wants to do with this part of your life. Invite him into the conversation. What what might God be asking you to let go of around generosity so that you can hang on to something better, so that he can have your heart and you can hang on to him? Let's pray. God, you're good. Thanks for your love and and goodness and grace this morning. And thank you, Jesus, for modeling what sacrifice looks like for us. And I know money's not like the topic that everybody shows up and gets excited about. But Jesus, this really practical thing is the way that you said we can be sure that you have our hearts. And Jesus, I can't think of a safer, more secure, more successful spot 
for my heart to be. And I believe that's true for everybody in this room. And so Jesus, would you just help us to take a step in your direction to trust? Would you prove that you're true because you said, test me in this? And would you allow us, Jesus, to, to experience the love and the grace and the good news that comes with you having, having our hearts? And Jesus, would you use us? Would this be a moment in time that we look back on? Where God, you started to do something in us and through us that didn't just change this community. But it changed our lives, and it changed our workplaces, our neighborhoods. It sort of changed Northwest Arkansas because a whole bunch of people came together and stacked hands and said, there's something really practical like money. We're going to trust Jesus with it. And Jesus is going to just change our community and our world. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.